Um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, what is Wiki Education, what is the Wiki Education Foundation. I'm going to tell you the story of someone, uh, one of the students in our program. And then I'm going to talk about like, uh, what is it that uh, students can learn when they edit Wikipedia as part of an assignment. So what is, what is Wiki Education? Wiki Education is a small nonprofit based in San Francisco. Um, started in 2014, um, we try to connect higher education and Wikipedia. I always thought, I always believed that higher education and Wikipedia belong together. Like there, there's a natural co connection between the two. And we're, we're trying to, um, on the one hand, we're trying to make Wikipedia more accurate more representative and more complete. You know, there's still, I mean, over, over time, there's still many, many mistakes still on Wikipedia, and it's like, uh, it's a good starting point. It's never an end point of your, your research, right? Um, but there are still many gaps, and that has to do with the, um, with the interest of the volunteers. If you edit Wikipedia in your free time, you want to edit the articles that uh, interest you, that, about topics that you're enthusiastic about. And so because the specific demographics on Wikipedia is mostly male, white, uh, well-educated, and relatively young, that's why um, Wikipedia has certain gaps in certain areas, because those people that fall into that demographics um, they write articles about uh, video games, about pop music, and that's the area where Wikipedia is really, really strong. Right? In some other areas, uh, Wikipedia is not so strong. And we're trying with um, engaging um, people in higher education, we're trying to change that. But at the same time, you can learn a lot when you're participating as a student in a Wikipedia assignment. And so uh, that is the... The one thing we do, we have two uh, program lines. One is for students. Uh, students write Wikipedia articles instead of a term paper. And that's a big thing for them. Many of them are scared, right? Like they, everybody who's at that age knows Wikipedia and they feel like, ooh, I'm, I'm gonna edit Wikipedia now. I'm gonna change something on Wikipedia. That's super scary, right? Um, and so uh, students write Wikipedia articles, that's our students program. And then something that we just started is uh, the scholars and scientists program. And the scholars and scientists program targets high profile Wikipedia articles um, and uh, scholars and scientists write those. So people who are farther in their career, um, who are maybe assistant professors or professors, and why would those people wanna edit Wikipedia in their free time? Because, like, Wikipedia is the place where everybody goes for information, right? And you want information about your topic area. You want that to be accurate. You want, that, you want your, your topic to be well represented on Wikipedia. And so uh, those are the two things that, that we're doing. And one result, um, some of you might s still, well, most of you might, might still remember this. This is Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and in April, uh, our organization reached a, a, a huge milestone. Uh, we're working with uh, more than 500 universities in the United States. Um, and most people get to know us through academic associations that we're partnering with. And the milestone that we reached in April was that uh, students in our program added the equivalent of all these volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica to Wikipedia, on the English Wikipedia, and that was a huge moment for us. Now, uh, learning outcomes for students. We uh, asked someone, we, we always knew, we, we heard so many stories about, like, we, we, heard, we got feedback from, from educators who said, well, my students learned so much, but we were not able to really quantify that. And, so, as you can imagine, if you, if you apply for, for grant money, um, 
people want to see numbers, right? And we were all, actually also, we wanted to know like, what is it actually that students get out of this? And, and like, how does that compare to uh, what we've heard before? And so uh, this is a, uh, a study, you can download it. If you, uh, student learning outcomes using Wikipedia-based assignments, when you Google that, you will find that. Like everything else that we do, this is, uh, has been released under free license. So you can download it for free. You don't have to pay for it. Just Google it and you can get more information. And the people who did this, um, and I only brought like a couple of examples here of like there's more in that study, you can imagine. But I brought some example of what instructors said. So we asked instructors, how, do, how does this uh, teaching with Wikipedia, how does that compare when you compare it to like a traditional assignment where students write a term paper or when people uh, write a, a Wikipedia article. And here's some of the results. So this is the percentage. What you see here, the bar, is the percentage of instructors um, who found Wikipedia assignments more or much more valuable than a traditional assignment. And so, um, you, you have to take into account that these are all people who have taught with Wikipedia before, so there's a slight bias, right? That they, they, they like it, of course they like it. Um, but like the results, I found those results quite, um, quite amazing. Um, online source reliable, uh, reliability, why is that important? Because people, uh, students uh, look for information online all the time. There is like a, a Stanford University uh, graduate School of Education study in 2016 uh, where the people at Stanford University looked into uh, how much do students know about like the reliability of information that they f find on the web. And it was quite dramatic. It was very, very bad, right? Like uh, people know how to use their phone, um, but like when it comes to online source reliability, um, it gets a little bit dicey. So, next one, digital literacy, right? Digital literacy is important. There's gonna be like in a couple of hours, I think my wife just went to bed in California, so in a couple of hours there are the midterm elections and people find information about like candidates and about all kinds of topics online. And like you, we want, I think we all want the, the next generation uh, of people no matter in which country we live, we want them to uh, have enough digital literacy so they know which information to trust on the internet and which not to trust, right? And instructors in this survey said, 96% of them said, a Wikipedia assignment is better at teaching students digital literacy than a traditional assignment. And then of course writing. And this is, we're talking, this is, this is the Global HR Forum, right? Like so, some of you uh, might come from, from a corporate background and you want uh, like what people in the United States call um, employability skills. And uh, whether you're a researcher or you work in, in the corporate world, you want uh, employees, you want people to work for you who can translate something, a very complex topic into something that everybody else can potentially understand. And so writing, uh, writing for a large audience is really important and translating it for, uh, for, for people. And so this is my, my last slide. Um, and um, this is a quote from, from one of our students. Uh, and she said, I was encouraged by more than the grade. I wanted to contribute to something long lasting and something bigger than myself. And this is the thing that I, I, I see every time when we talk to participants in our program, that they're more motivated. They're more motivated during that class because they feel like what they're doing during the class has value for someone else. And that's what uh, Wikipedia stands for. That's why I personally uh, spend so much time uh, on my weekends or after work on improving uh, little things on Wikipedia because I really believe that uh, people should have access, free access to uh, general information and that's what Wikipedia stands for. Thank you.
I, uh, I will start from the uh, topic about the change. Uh, let's look at the, the chart. This is the trend of the global GDP in the past 2,000 years. It can be seen that this change has been very slow for a long time in the past. This line is almost flat. The change began to accelerate in the middle 19th century, when the first industrial revolution began. And the rapid start of change began in the middle 20th century, when computers were invented and a human began to enter the information technology. The change we have made in the society over the past few decades have outweighed the past few thousand years, and everything is changing very rapid. So this is the change about the society. Let's think about the change on education. I think the most important change is that education needs to change from the transfer of knowledge to the cultivation of ability. There are many abilities that need, need to be cultivated. Generally speaking, I think the most important abilities are the following three aspects. The ability to solve problems in the known world, the ability to create new things in the unknown world, and the ability to learn and adapt in the rapidly changing world. So for these abilities, technology will play a very important role. Because for the past few years change, I think the most important role is technology. Computer, machines, that, that contribute to the uh, achievement that we have. I think with powerful technical tools, today's children can solve more complex problems and their boundaries of creation will be broader. So imagine when I was a child, about 30 years ago, so the creation that I can do is uh, play with the clay, to cut wood with a small wife, or other simple handwork. You may have a lot of crazy ideas, but uh, at that time, the ideas are always ideas. You, it's very hard for, for you to realize the ideas. But what will happen if we replace the shovel with a giant digger? We give it to the children to see what they can do with this new tool. The modern technology is like the giant digger. The goal of Makebrook is try to give the digger to every child. We divide the technology into three main areas, mechanics, electronics, and uh, software. Of course, there are other technology fields, such as biological, chemistry, extra. But these fields are not, right now, are not our focus. We focus in these three uh, technology areas. So what do we do? with the make blog start about uh, mm, six years ago. And uh, for, for these so many years, we, uh, our goal is uh, we, uh, we follow two directions to do all our business. The first, we try to provide an integrated platform, including mechanics, electronics, and uh, software. We try to provide a platform to help kids to realize the, their ideas based on this, this platform. Another direction is to lower the threshold of creation, to make mechanical building easier, to make electronic easier, to make programming easier, and uh, to make the creation more easier for many kids. So here is uh, our solution.
This is uh, what Makeblock do in the very beginning. This is our first generation of a solution on this problem. So on mechanical side, we are using metal parts for the users to build some professional robots. And uh, on the electronic side, we choose Arduino, but it's not a standard Arduino. We based on Arduino to make some uh, modification to make the wiring much easier. And uh, on the software side, we, uh, we choose a Scratch because Scratch is a popular graphic programming language for keys. And we make some development to help Scratch users can use Scratch to programming Arduino. But that's not enough. So that's the first generation. And uh, you know, Scratch is very uh, friendly for entry level users. But for some experienced users, Scratch may not be enough. So we uh, integrated Scratch with uh, Python. And uh, so that's the next step Scratch and the Python on software side. But we, uh, we did, not, did not stop there. Uh, electronics are always very complicated for, for keys. Even Arduino is uh, hard for them. So we started to think, how can we make this much simpler? And uh, in the same time, the po much powerful. So that's uh, Neuron, our next solution. So neuron is a kind of uh, electronic bricks that uh, the wiring is much easier. Actually, there's no wiring. We are using magnetic connector, and uh, the children they don't need to uh, to worry about. Uh, they make the wrong wiring, and uh, but electronic is only one side. We developed a programming tool for neuron, which is uh, much easier than scratch. It works like this. We call it a flow-based programming. You just need to drag the to draw the line. So this tool is uh, very uh, e very friendly, even for users. They don't know how to use if else why uh, why are this kind of uh, programming language. So that's on the software side. But we uh, we still to think. Um, we don't want to limit our users to use only metal materials to build. There are many other materials can uh, build many types of things. So we uh, we started to uh, like uh, to include other materials like cardboard and uh, wood. So uh, that's, that's the uh, solution we have before. Uh, on mechanical side, on electronic side, and uh, on software side, we try to provide a wider solution for, for users, not to limit their creation. And in the same time, we want to make the technology very easy to use. And uh, yeah, so our goal, MakePlot's goal is to help more people to enjoy the the, the process of creating things, not only for the keys, but I think for, for many people like us, we all have ideas. But before, most of the time, we just think this kind of ideas is very hard for us. So we, just, we always keep ideas in our mind. It's just ideas. But we hope in the future, with the help of the advanced technology, everyone can enjoy to realize their ideas. Thank you.
Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. You know, I came here to this panel with one question in mind. And this question is something like this. That how can it be that so many parents nowadays, increasing number of mothers and fathers, are looking for school for their children where the children would be able to learn and grow without technology. This is particularly true in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the Silicon Valley, where many of these companies are, are working. Many of, the, many of the parents, rather than send their children in the schools where their products and technology is used, instead choose schools like Waldorf or Montessori, or schools that are focusing on arts and music and drama and play or physical activity. So my question is, why is that? What's going on? And one kind of a conclusion I have is that would it be true that it's easier to think about education and particularly innovation in education when we think about other parents' children rather than our own? Okay? So, Raise your hand if you have your own children in school right now, not university, but in the school. Raise your hand if you have your own kids going to school right now. Am I the only one? Some of you. So I invite all of you to you know, think about these questions that we are, we are discussing here in this forum from your own children's point of view. And I, I tell you upfront that I have, we have two little uh, boys at home. Um, they're in a, in a preschool and elementary school age. And these questions that we often discuss here are very personal to me. So I'm not talking about what I think and expect for, for other parents' children. I'm a answering these questions. What is the future education from my own children's point of view? What type of school would I like to have for my own kids? And it's a completely different world when you think about other people's children. So that's, that's my starting point, and I, I have a little bit different argument here. I basically, basically what I try to argue with you here is that 20 years ago, it was a very common in a forum and conference like this to ask questions like, how do we prepare children for the world that is full of all these opportunities with the new technologies? And I think, when I think about my own children, that the question for me is now that, how do, how do we prepare children to live without this technology that is surrounding them and everybody has access now? It's a, it's a very different, different thing. It has nothing to do with whether you are in favor or against technology. That's not the point. That is what our education systems should do. So the, the, the statement we often hear is that you know, the world has changed, everything has changed, so the school education and what we do in schools have to change as well. And technology has been one of those key drivers in this change. Uh, and as you heard from the former prime minister of Sweden this morning, if you went to the opening ceremony, he said, what I was supposed to say here, is that everybody likes change, except that they, want, they don't want to change themselves. In Finland, we say that, we have this saying that, I love change, but you go first. I love, I, I love change, but you should go first. You try it first, because I don't know what's going to happen. And now, of course, we do know that technology can do anything, almost anything. We can write research papers and publish them in peer-reviewed journals written by artificial intelligence. We can operate people. We can drive cars and airplanes, almost anything. So, of course, the question is that why not Education, why not what teachers normally do or professors do in a university? I have a question for you because one of those interesting things that the artificial intelligence can do now is to create arts. You know, symphony, symphonies have been composed and songs, pop song, songs have been made without any human touch. You see three images here. You probably recognize the artist. And my question is that which one of these was made by machine? Now, raise your hand here in the room if you think that it's uh, the painting A was made by artificial intelligence. Okay? Raise your hand if you're sure that it's a, it's a B. Some of you. 
<laughs> How about C? Raise your hand. OK, good. So those who voted for C, you were right. This is, this is made by the uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence. It's very hard to tell the difference. And you know that this is Van Gogh's uh, paintings, two of these. And if you want to know more about how the machine can learn to paint like a, like a Vincent Van Gogh, go and see it um, in Wikipedia. You can, you can read it over there. Now, let's go back about 20 years, 18 years backwards. And you know, then one of the concerns in a conference like this would be people were talking about the digital divide, the fact that there's a huge gap between those who have access to technology, particularly computers at home, and those who haven't. And 18 years ago, there, indeed, there was a huge divide between, uh, between people who have and have not access to computer at, at home. So then, of course, you know, there are organizations like the OECD who say that you know, the, main, the main thing that we need to do is to close this uh, divide, this gap between those who have and those who have not, by purchasing, buying more computers and technology into schools. And this is what we have seen happening around the world in our schools during the last 20 years. A huge investments in hardware and software, in, often in the name of closing this divide, this gap between uh, uh, those who have access and those who have not. Now, you know, we do know also from research that things were not really playing out as many people were hoping 20 years ago. There were high hopes of technology being able to also close the achievement gap in schools because of the technology, but that hasn't happened. Actually, the OECD a couple of years ago concluded that, ironically, that more technology is used in schools, less, less children learn there. So there's, there was a negative correlation between the, the use of technology in teaching and learning and what the kids are learning, particularly when it comes to mathematics and reading. So there are a lot of things that we don't kind of know how things are going on. Let's see what is the, the situation right now as we speak here regarding the digital divide. And again, my argument here is that we do have a digital divide, but it's a very different than it was 20 years ago. Now, look at these, some of these numbers. The, the num number of teenagers who have access to smartphone, and this is, this is from the, the wealthier part of the world. The statistics is from the OECD, or, or these numbers are directly from the United States. It's the same thing in Germany and Finland, and probably here in South Korea and many other countries. Almost everybody, all the teenagers, are carrying smartphone in their pockets. Then almost half of the teenagers around the world uh, but particularly in these countries that I mentioned, are online practically all the time. And all the time means at nights, and all the time means when they are in a classroom doing what the teachers are expecting them to do. And practically everybody, all the children under eight, have access to mobile device at home. Just look at this. So where is the divide now? Can we say that the divide has kind of disappeared? You know, one thing that has emerged together with this 18, 20 years of progress since year 2000, is that we have a new problem. We have a new issue that may or may not be the, the result of this closing this um, digital gap. But let, let's take a look at this. You know, one thing that is really concerning many parents and many teachers around the world, and particularly many medical health people around the world, is that when we look at the the well-being and health of our young people, it has been declining. And there are many people who don't quite understand why this is happening. You know, what is behind this decline, particularly when it started to decline faster than ever before around 2011 or 2012. And this is the same thing in the United States and Finland, my own country, Australia, where I live now, the, the numbers are the same. New Zealand, uh, all across the Europe. I don't know what is it here in, in um, uh, South Korea. But it's a very clear that there's something has been going on with the children's lives that is causing or part of the cause of this declining well-being and health. This is really a critical uh, situation. You know, one thing that has happened is the, the amount of time that young people, particularly teenagers, spend on watching uh, screens and using time with the technology. So this is a study that um, we are now partnering uh, at the University of New South Wales. This is the, the ongoing research um, taking place in the, the province of Alberta in Canada. 
uh, led by the, um, the University of uh, the, uh, the Harvard University's uh, Medical School and the Boston Children's Hospital, where the the research is looking at from the teacher's perspective how the classrooms, how the children have changed during the last five years. So the, the results that you see in this infograph indicate what the teachers in Alberta, how did they respond to these questions of what type of changes they have seen in their own classrooms. About 5,000 teachers answered this across the province. And you can see that anything between 85 and 90% of teachers in Alberta say that they have seen either uh, psychological, social, or behavioral changes and problems more in their classrooms than before. It's a very alarming thing, and what we try to do through our research is to do, replicate the same study in Australia and see whether, whether this is the situation there as well. So there's clearly something happening there, and we need to be uh, aware of this. So this, uh, I, I call this the new digital divide, or, or digital divide 2.0 looks very different than what it was 20 years ago. Remember 20 years ago, it was a kind of a gap between those who have access to computers and technology and those who haven't, and we have been able to close that, but now we have a new issue. And if we look at the teenagers now, in the, this is in the United States, you see that the lower income teenagers, so those who come from the poorer homes, they spend about eight and a half hours with the screens every day, okay? The higher income children, the, the difference is uh, significantly less. And again, the question is that why is this? Why do we have a difference between high income and low income children in terms of how much time they spend with the, with the screens and technology? Now, this is another one. This is from the, the Pew um, Research Center data very recently where, where we can confirm the same type of trend. The question here was in the survey that um, how often children, teenagers have, asked, have been asked to do homework on their cell phone or smartphone. And you will see that those who answered often or sometimes, if you look at the lower income, it's, a, it's a nearly half of them were using cell phone for their homework, whereas the high income kids was uh, barely 30%. Okay? A big issue. So the gap is now probably between the um, w between the social classes in our societies. So many people now conclude that what, what is happening now, rather than a kind of a systematic way of trying to improve teaching and learning and our schools using technology, but that we are witnessing a huge uh, social experiment on children. Nobody knows how this is going to play out. Nobody knows what will be the impact in the end of all these experiments that we are doing um, in the name of good, looking for a good and better education. So what should schools do? I think this is the question that we are, um, we are talking about here. What should we look at in, um, in, in the schools? Now, it could be, as you see here, that in the future we're going to see the trend where the, the parents, like those in Silicon Valley right now are doing, and many other capitals and, and wealthy parts of the, the world, that they are sending their children to the schools where they can be exposed with a human interaction, with a real teacher. Whereas those who have, do not have this privilege will find their children in the schools where they will be eventually taught by robots or technology. Now, I leave this question for you to think about whether this is something that we should be, be concerned uh, or not. But with this kind of a statement, I, I'm going to leave you with five things that I think I would like to see in the future school again through my own children, not just looking at somebody else's kids. Five things that I would really love to see. You may call them innovation. Um, I, I actually call them a renaissance of education, you know, build, bringing back some of those things that we used to have in the schools, but in a different way. The, the first thing is that I think every school, or good, every good school in the future, should focus on teaching self-control to children. The government of France, a couple of months ago, banned all smartphones in their, every school in France from the kids who are 15 years or younger. I don't know what you think about that, but I do think that this is, a, in a way, a kind of a problematic thing because it takes away of the opportunity now to really teach the self-control to young people in a school rather than ban things. 
And from social research, we do know that one of the, the most uh, effective ways to leave a lifelong uh, track on people, people's lives and help them to, to thrive is to teach them self-control. Okay? So that's one, one thing that I would love to see my own children w when they are in a school to, to learn with teachers and other people to how they can learn to manage and control their own behaviors and thinking, particularly when it comes to using and uh, understanding technology. Then the other one is read, read more books. It's as simple like this. Some people say that it doesn't make really a difference whether you use Kindle or book. Then there are those researchers who say that there's a big difference in terms of how you feel about it and how you learn and uh, how, how you progress your reading. Um, I really don't care how it is. It can be even audio books. But I think we need to particularly focus on uh, teenager boys, bring them back to reading books. That's the number one problem in Finland. And it's a huge problem in many other countries that young boys don't read anymore. They don't read anything. And that is a problem. We have an issue if, if people, young people do not read anymore. Then the third one is sleep more, period, sleep more. You know what's happening in, around the world is that teenagers and, and children are sleeping much less than they should. Any pediatrician should say that a teenager should sleep anything between 9 and 11 hours every night. In America, in Australia and Finland, the average now is 7.5 hours. And it's an average, so it means that there are many who sleep much less and there are some who sleep more. So if you, if you are kind of in favor of homework, give your children homework, sleep two extra hours every night. <laughs> That's the best homework right now that I, uh, I can imagine. Then the, th the fourth one is to write letters, and not with a computer or iPad or smartphone, longhand. <laughs> write a letter to your grandmother every week using pen and paper and tell what ha what's happening in your life, what, what, what did you learn in the school. And this is not in kind of a, to replace the computer and what you can do. There are many, many things that you can do with Wikipedia and others that you can do um, typing with your computer. But we need to teach empathy as well. And the best way to teach empathy is to write, use your own hand and write a letter on paper and put it in an envelope and send it to your grandmother that you love or grandfather or anybody you like. That's what I would like my, my children to do in a school every week. And last thing here is play hard. So play as hard as you work and study hard. And this is something that many, peop many of those people that I started my story with are saying that I want to have a school and place where my children can play because when they play they will learn all these critical things that they need in this world that is full of technology. And then there are those who say that when children play, they also learn these critical things that they need to be good in coding, to be good in designing games Play and uh, technology. And that's why playing more is a critical thing. Play is, is disappearing in the lives of young children at home and in school and many parts of the world. We have to bring play back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your good presentation. So I would like to give a question and then uh, point out uh, the speakers and answer the discussion. First question is, is uh, innovative solution are available on developed or developing countries? World is becoming more smaller because of technologies. But there are poor countries that can provide with education or using generation of country. Is there any innovative solution for that kind of uh, countries? Um, I, I think there's also, like there have been uh, projects in the past where like more developed countries thought that by just dropping technology into uh, other countries, uh, things would change and th that would be a solution. Um, I'm thinking uh, about a case that I discussed with uh, one of our instructors in our program um, from Columbia University and uh, she 
presented two weeks ago at a, a conference and she talked about uh, the project uh, One Laptop uh, Per Child. And uh, she talked about the fact that in Peru, uh, those little devices um, had been unused for many, many years um, because the one thing that people didn't understand, th those people who, who um, distributed the devices, is um, that technology does not work on its own. You have to uh, not only provide um, the, the, the technologies or the devices, you also have to um, talk about and, and, and see like how those devices could be used um, if, you, if you need to use them. Um, and so I think that um, you see so many examples of, um, okay, there is like a, like a class where like uh, Apple provides uh, iPads and, and that's uh, then the, the big solution is that uh, children just use iPads and I, I, I don't think that is, is a solution. If you have uh, specific use cases that make sense, then okay, it's good to have an iPad, but otherwise um, just, um, I, I, I'm very, like as, uh, as a uh, Wikipedian, I'm very sympathetic to what you just said because we love books. That's where we get the information that we put into Wikipedia. <laughs> and I'm, uh, personally, I'm, I'm a big book lover and what you just said uh, resonates a lot with me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason Wan? Okay, it's a, it's a Korean version here. I read it and then I translate it later. Okay. 중학교 3학년 학생입니다. Jason Wan께 질문. 드립니다. 아이들에게 코딩 교육을 하는 것은 기술적인 부분이 가장 중요하다고 하셨는데요. 아이들에게 코딩을 가르치는 과정에서 코딩을 단순화한다는 것은 그들에게 접근하기에 굉장히 에, 효과적인 방법이라고 생각합니다. 그러나 코딩을 너무 단순화하여 교육을 하게 되면 아이들은 결국 코딩에 대한 개념과 원리를 이해하기 힘들 수 있다고 생각합니다. 또한 이런 과정이라면 이것은 코딩 교육이라고 보다는 미술 교육에 가까워질 수도 있다고 생각하여 Excuse me So, make a blog의 근본적인 목적이 무엇인지 궁금해졌습니다 Okay um, Actually, I think it's the purpose is not to teach coding We don't need uh, so many software engineers in the future because coding is a kind of a tool that uh, to help to create. If some days we, we have a much stronger tools that uh, can uh, help us to realize our, our ideas without coding, I think that's what we want. But uh, right now, yes, we, uh, we need to teach uh, kids to write the basic code. Uh, you know, so most of the coding tools is, uh, is in the computer. So most of the teaching process is like uh, uh, write a code, write, write some programming, and uh, control something in the screen. You know, the kids nowadays, they are growing up with, uh, with iPad. So everything in the screen is, uh, is not attractive to them. So I think we need to make this process very uh, interesting for them. Uh, control something in the, in the computer, in the screen. Is, is not that attractive, but control something in the real world, control a robot to do something, I think is much more attractive for this kind of uh, uh, keys. So in my opinion, um, we, we should uh, use other things to make the, the process of teaching code uh, very interesting. Uh, we can think about it like uh, uh, use to, uh, to include hardware, to include teamwork and uh, other things to make this process much easier, uh, much, much attractive. I think that this, this is not uh, very hard for kids. For kids, they are very smart. We, they have a, very, a lot of potential. The only thing we need to do is to attract, attract them, uh, act, uh, uh, to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to attract them, to uh, uh, encourage them to spend more time on this. Yeah, so I think the, the, the hardware may be uh, uh, much more uh, interesting during the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay, this time is question to Frank. Okay, it's the Korean version. Wiki 학습을 이용하는 것은 좋은 시도라고 봅니다. 
자신의 학습이 다양한 사람들에게 전달이 된다는 것은 매우 어, 보람 있는 일입니다. 다만 잘못된 지식과 정보가 특정한 목적으로 전달되는 창구로 활용이 될수 있는 가능성에 대해서는 어떻게 생각하시는지요? 만약 그런 일이 발생한다면 이 프로젝트가 추구하고자 하는 목적을 반하는 일이 아닐까요? 그 부분을 제외하면 위키, 어, 위키 에듀케이션이 추구하는 방향에 대해서는 많이 공감합니다. So, um, if I understand the, the question correctly, you were asking about like what if people use this concept of uh, teaching with Wikipedia uh, for the uh, inserting incorrect information into Wikipedia. Um, and um, I, I have to say I've never, I've never thought about it that way. Um, I think that there are uh, a <laughs> number of controls uh, in place. Um, in the end, the students who participate in, uh, in an assignment like that um, they, they want to get a grade, um, and uh, so there is a teacher who, who grades that, uh, that article that they created. And so um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is, a, um, this is really um, um, a, a scenario that, that I could imagine. Um, actually, when you look at it from a student's perspective, um, what we've seen is that students put much more time into those assignments than they would put in a different assignment. And the reason for that is clear. Most of the students are terribly afraid um, to do exactly what you're asking, to insert information that is potentially wrong and that could uh, give other people a wrong direction for whatever they're looking for. It's still from a personal perspective to say that as well. Um, I'm still frightened of that as well. Like I, I don't know how many books I, I, I've read for, for my last article um, and how many hours I spent. Sometimes I work like for several months on, on, on a little piece of information that I put into Wikipedia because I feel a, a huge sense of responsibility. I know that some of my articles on the German Wikipedia get more readers than most of the experts in that field get readers. And that makes me really afraid and I'm, I'm really, really trying very hard to uh, give people in, in Germany and other German speaking countries the information uh, that they need and as accurate as possible. Okay, thank you Frank. And uh, is there any ideas, any suggestions on how we can utilize this effectively at the school, uh, school setting? Yeah, well, let me start first because it would be foolish to travel all the way from Sydney, Australia here without any ideas what to do, <laughs> practical things. So certainly, you know, one, and it's a, I, I think it's a great question really to, to end the panel. And, you, you know, what, what is like, a, I, I, I would trans transform this question into something like, so what would be one thing that we could do in our schools to, to make, make sure that we will end up having a good or better future with, with or without these things that we have uh, in mind. Uh, you know, one thing I have in mind, I'm not saying that this is the, the only one or um, even in the kind of a, the most, uh, most important thing, but one thing we need to be clear in our schools, anybody here who is a teacher, if you, if you work with the children, or if you parent, Let's make sure that we help our young people, all of them, to understand that they, there is no such skill as multitasking. There is no such thing that the human being would be able to do several things simultaneously without turning the other thing or other things into autopilot. That's how our brain works. And this is, I've met a lot of students at my university and in schools who believe this. They think that you know, if I practice enough, I can learn how to multitask. I can, I can learn how to do several things at the same time. But we have to teach everybody that this is not, this is beyond the capacity of our brain. Nobody can do that. And if we learn this, 
then of course it, it means that at home, with some, if somebody's doing homework, you cannot watch film and listen to music and chat with somebody and then read a book. It just doesn't happen. And it's the same, same, same thing in the school, that, you can, that human beings can only do one thing at the time. And, and therefore, the technology can be a very disturbing thing here if we believe that the kids can you know, use technology and read or, or listen or watch something there while they're trying to do something else. I think this is, this is one of those things that might have a potential to change really many things that we do in our schools and universities if we were able to help people to understand that you cannot do several things simultaneously. It's just one thing at a time. So that's my concrete... Your, your conclusion. So I would like to finalize uh, some comment. I think it's a, they are all talking about uh, edu educational technology and how you can utilize it effectively for the learning in the school setting or individual basis. But uh, there is a critical issue, so three issues in my maybe five issues. I just raised the issues. We don't have any uh, enough time to uh, debate that. A uh, privatization of education. That's uh, really one big issue, seems to me. Second thing is data fication of individual learners. They are private issues. And third one, what's the goal or function of learning? So there's a utilized uh, high tech high uh, educational technology for effectively learn something. But uh, what's the real goal and the function of learning? For what? That's the basic questions. They're supposed to have answered that too. Uh, they, they have one question there. So educational industrialization. There's a two big debates, big war between formal schooling and the private uh, sectors. So these two are how we can effectively combine those issues are really big issues. We didn't cover that one. So educational technology is a long journey. It's just a starting point. I think the rapid change will be. My personal term is university will disappear. School disappeared pretty soon because curriculum or paradigm shift will be happen pretty soon, in my personal opinion. So university and the schools will be a platform learning hub, that's all. And the learners will be, a, my term is a self-learner tailored learning schemes will be. No curriculum, no, no time limit, no campus will be. Then those high education technology will be really helpful for individual learners. But there's the basic questions. Then for what? What's the real goal and function and the purpose of education in terms of individual development, moral development, citizenship, etc.? That's my big question. Uh, one more thing. I have a lot of things here to talk, but I'm a moderator, so. I think it's uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution age. There is, in my personal, three free educational paradigm shift will be happen. First one, time free, location free, curriculum free. In other words, content free. Third one, three less, campus less, book less, professor, teacher less. Thank you very much. <laughs>